Today, I had the joy of speaking with someone I have admired from afar since watching her on Gwyneth Paltrow's Netflix show, Sex, Love, and Goop. Michaela Baum teaches and counsels internationally as an expert in intimacy and relationships. She is a gifted speaker and counselor. Her unique body of work centers on the intersection of intimacy and embodiment. Michaela is the author of The Wild Woman's Way, which is a guide to helping us reconnect to our body's innate wisdom. I've been applying the skills Michaela teaches in my own life. She guides us to live a more embodied life, use our intuition, and connect to ourselves and each other more deeply. Enjoy. Welcome to Let's Talk Love, the podcast that brings you real talk, fresh ideas, and expert insights every week. Our guests are the most trusted voices in love and relationships, and they're here for you with tools, information, and friendly advice to help you expand the ways you love, relate, and communicate. We tackle the big questions, not shying away from the complex, the messy, the awkward, and the joyful parts of relationships. I'm your host, Robin Ducharme. Now, let's talk love. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Let's Talk Love. I'm so excited to welcome our beautiful guest today, Michaela (laughs) Bohm. Thank you for joining us, Michaela. Oh, hello, and thanks for having me. This This is really exciting. I met you on the screen. I didn't meet you in person, but I was introduced to you when I was watching Love, Sex, and Goop. And... I absolutely loved that show and your part in it. And, you know, you like I I learned so much watching that series. (laughs) And over the last few weeks, I've been reading your book, The Wild Woman's Way, and continue um, my journey of learning from you, Michaela. And I just wanted to say, like, I just I, I love the work you're doing in the world and I'm just excited to talk about talk to you and re- and <laughs> continue continue learning from you. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny because every week I interview um, an, a different relationship expert, and I think there's something beautiful and synchronistic about the work that we're doing because when I when I read the books and then I interview the expert, it's like the, this is the, what I needed to learn at this exact time in my life. And can you talk to us about your book and what it's about? Why you, why you wrote the book? Yes. Well, it's the hopefully one of many to come um, because it's it was a yes. kind of a first entry into uh, a body of work that I've created over more than 25 years now. And The Wild Woman's Way is essentially the aspect of my work that deals with rewilding, you know, and um, rewilding in the context of bringing the body back into not only life, but relationship, pleasure, um, you know, the engagement with others, uh, not only, you know, uh, from a relationship standpoint, but also of who we are in the world and how we navigate our various relationships. And so I, it was really meant to be a manual for women in the 21st century and the demands that we have on our bodies and our, you know, emotions and our minds in the context of it being so busy and there being so much doing and so little bit, so little, I should say, you know, of the being and relaxing and having the aspects that are dear to most of us. Yes. So, yeah. (laughs) And this is what you're, this was what I was reminded of while I was, reading and listening. I listened to your book and I read it at the same time, which is my favorite thing to do because I love, thank you for narrating your own book. That is so important when you hear your voice and your intuition or your intonation and, and your intuition um, coming through um, when somebody's listening to you. It's, that is so powerful. And I love this. You, you're, you're just such a great storyteller. You share a lot of stories in your book about, you start off talking about yourself as a little girl growing up in Austria. And I, I can picture it, right? You say, I grew up, like, you know, the sound of music, the beautiful fields of the flowers and the, and the um, scenery, and you could just picture it, right? And you say when you were a little girl, 
you aspired to be a witch. You said, I wanted to be a witch. And you were so connected to the land and the flowers and animals and mm -hmm. your love for animals. And that was, that's just a beautiful picture. And I think where, where I, what I gleaned from that was around this idea that even when we're little, like we have these dreams, these aspirations and our gifts come out, right? And somehow, in our adult lives and throughout, you know, going through life, we lose. We, some, some of us can be, we lose that sense of where we were really born to do and where we where we're naturally inclined to be and do in the world, which is what you're helping people come back to is like, what are your gifts and what do you, are you naturally inclined to be in the world? Mm. Yeah, and I think, yes, for, yeah, and I'm very passionate about that, particularly in the context of who we are when it comes not only to relationship, but to who we are in the world, because a lot of times we're told we're not enough of this, or this part of us is sufficient, is not sufficient, or we should change. And a lot of the personal growth industry, of course, is all about um, if you could just change this or have this breakthrough, you'd be okay. And the whole concept of rewilding is essentially coming yeah. back to our original nature. And with that, of course, to who we really are when we're not forced to be whatever, right? The, the thing that society or our own conditioning or other people's conditioning forces us to be. And so that's, it's, I think, very important that when we kind of remember who we really are, that's a gift to everyone, including ourselves. Absolutely. And so you, you've had, a, like you said, you've had decades of experience working with people and in psychology and helping them as a counselor, as a therapist and as a healer, right? So you, I love the story of how you, like you were so passionate with your, with your teacher who you traveled around Germany, following, following and learning from her um, and studying psychology. And then you landed, your, your, can you talk to us about your practice in Los Angeles and how you came to that point in your life after so many years of doing it and being so busy and, you know, eight hours of work, working in therapy with these high influential clients. And then at night you're working more and more because you're You've got a, bit, a very busy practice that you're running in a very busy place of Los Angeles down, right? And then you decided, okay, this, is, this, this can't be for me anymore. I need to rewild almost. You started your own process of rewilding and moving to the country where you've got this home now. Can you share a little yeah. of that story? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, you pretty much told the story, but, uh, but to elaborate on that, I've done an enormous amount of client hours. I've done over 35,000 one-on-one client hours uh, and uh, a fair yeah. share of that with some really heavy duty clinical focus on, um, you know, I mean, ob always oriented towards relationships, but I've done quite a bit of work with very traumatized populations and um, in the context of, mm. um, you know, uh, addiction and abuse and things as well. So, my background is both in the classical, let's say, relationship counseling domain, but it's also in the trauma therapy and, and working, um, in, you know, in the realms of it not being so good. And, um, uh, that of course takes a toll on, on the body and the mind as well. And so, um, about 10 or 12 years into doing that, I decided I needed a bit more space as well. And uh, I found this gorgeous, gorgeous property about an hour and a half north of uh, Los Angeles. And I eventually transitioned. And that transition in itself was both excruciating and miraculous in the sense that I still maintained an apartment and an office in West Hollywood. And I lived out here and the gap got bigger and bigger. And um, I had to kind of, you know, eventually make some decisions around uh, not doing, you know, the office anymore. And that process was very instructional because nowadays, of course, I know that um, it's possible to do both if you have enough 
practice in both realms. But back then, of course, I didn't have enough practice in both realms, meaning I didn't have that strong of a connection in nature because West Hollywood isn't exactly a place of na- nature anymore. It's very loud and very full. And so, uh, you know, now I get to be here and be in nature, but I also get to do busy towns and travel and, you know, kind of being in the world and I can come back to a place of rest. Uh, I can also find that place of rest more internal, but it took the coming back to nature, uh, you know, externally first before I could come back to nature internally. Yeah. Beautiful. I love the story of just how you how the property came into your life and then your community gathered around you, your tribe, you know, the neighbors that came in and, and helped support your move. It's just beautiful. So you're you are helping women and men rewild. And you talk about a wild woman archetype. Can you explain to us really what an archetype is and what the wild woman archetype is? Yes, I can. <laughs> so, um, well, first of all, archetypes in general, right, are essentially a way to bring uh, collective experiences into from the subconscious, or in Jung, you know, Jung would call it the collective unconscious, into conscious awareness. And so, when something is is raised from the kind of more instinctive in the body, in the subconscious aspect. To the conscious aspect, we can, of course, examine it and we can make sense of things. And we can also find ourselves within the archetype because we all have all these parts of us. So archetypes are a very, very useful lens for self-exploration. And furthermore, archetypes are a way for us to link into a wisdom that's already been um mined or discovered or, you know, brought into existence that we can kind of lean into or, or make use of. So when we look at archetypes in general, it's kind of a really useful way to look at what have, what have humans experienced for millions of years, essentially. And then from there, uh, we can mm-hmm. pick archetypes as a means of engaging with certain slices of that experience. And so myth and archetypes, you know, these go hand in hand, are very useful um, as an as a tool for self-exploration, uh, which I I personally love a lot and work with a lot because it's kind of a sideways entrance and it's not as full on and it allows each person to um, find themselves without being forced to, um, you know, confront something head on, which is sometimes not possible. So uh, that is, that, that's to be said about archetypes. And now the wild woman archetype specifically is kind of, a, it's a bit deceiving in the context of um, people think it's like this crazy, you know, spitting nails, clawing at the wall, mad woman. And you always hear this, right, from people who, yeah. haven't really uh, kind of really engaged with it, but really what the wild woman archetype is, and it's not just for women, you know, we all, all archetypes apl- apply to all humans, but the wild woman archetype is specifically the archetype that connects us back to nature. And nature as in our original nature, meaning who we are as a human, Um, and how we, our talents and gifts arise, but also nature as in the part of us that's ancient, right? Our bodies have kept us alive and kept us thriving for much longer than we had brains, like, you know, hyper-developed brains. So that part of us that is essentially connected to instinct, connected to um, how to live and thrive and survive in, in the world, that's the wild woman. And furthermore, the wild woman is the part of us that is connected to rhythms, our own, with, you know, could be menstrual cycles or circadian rhythms or things of that nature. And then how our body rela- relates with the natural world, meaning 
the rising and falling of tides, the moon, uh, seasons, uh, sunlight versus, you know, the sun going down. Nowadays, of course, there's lots of research on circadian rhythms and how they are important for uh, humans, particularly in this moment in time with artificial light and things like that. So that's the archetype. And within that archetype, there's a vast exploration of who are we when we get to be us? And then also how are we connected to nature and how can we use that connection for not only optimal living, but also thriving? Yes. And you... You say the wild woman is an antidote to the common self-development fallacy, which operates on not being enough. And you touched on that, right? It's like, and it's true. You say not, not, um, not being enough is big business. It absolutely is. We're just so drowned by um, these ideas that we have to be thin and we have to be career women, but also excellent mothers. And you can, and you say, this is, this is like, we're, we're just so wrapped up in who we should be, according to social norms, that you, you also say you can't, you can't be it all. You can't do it all. So we have to be way more realistic about that as women. It's like making yeah. choices that, that are aligned with what we truly, truly want. And a lot of us sometimes don't know what we want. So that has to, that's, 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 really, that's a really important understanding. It is, and it's uh, really so, liberating. You know, well, uh, to, yes. to finish my sentence, it is very liberating when you understand that you don't have to be everything and also that you can learn to have different aspects available and switch back and forth. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this... There was, there's so many different concepts in this book that you teach. And I just like one of the, one of them, which made su such such sense to me and like was quite like a good way, a simplistic way to look at this is like we are, so much of us are stuck in go mode that we're no longer in flow. Right. It's like go versus flow. And I thought of, and, and, and it makes sense. Right. Like if you're, for, for instance, with me, with my work and I'm sure you you too, Michaela, sometimes like you're, you know, you're sitting and you're on your computer, if you're doing interviews all day or whatever, um, you are all in your head. You're not in your body. And you're giving people tools on how to come back more. In, and so it makes sense that you're not being able to tap into the wisdom of your body if it's all in your head, which a lot of us operate from a lot of our days. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 so yes I, I mean there's so much in here but one of the things that's very important and that's why I call it go and flow and not you know some of the the uh, previous tropes used in this context like masculine and feminine for instance I don't use those terms specifically because they have nothing to do with masculine and feminine meaning man and woman um, you know, so, and often when people use those terms interchangeable, there's a real, um, suffering there, both in creating kind of a, a separation of ourselves with ourselves and also with the external genders and things of that nature. So what I call go is essentially the part of us that gets stuff done. And, you know, meaning everything that has to do with being on the computer, guiding things, making things happen, checking things off lists, um, you know, giving str uh, like strategy or going places. Um, what we are doing right now is certainly go in the context of we're both thinking, we're looking, we're speaking, we're, uh, you know, getting something done. And go happens in the upper part of the body. And that's important to understand because what happens in the lower part of the body when we are up here very engaged is the lower part of the body is essentially parked. And what I mean with parked is you don't need much energy in the lower part of the body. And on the contrary, um, when the energy is uh, needed up here, 
it needs to be pulled from the lower part of the body because we have a finite amount of energy per second as human beings. So the body is incredibly energy efficient and wherever we don't need energy, it's being pulled from and allocated where we need it. And that is not a problem. And that's why I don't like this. Oh, you're in your masculine. You're not in your masculine. You're simply using energy where it's needed. That's neither a good thing nor a bad thing. It's the thing that the body does. So at the same time, when we do need the energy further down in our body, we typically need that energy further down in the body for things like um, pleasure, intuition, boundary setting, mm. sourcing extra power, um, you know, grounding, all of those things that happen in the lower body, which is what I call flow, relaxation, enjoyment, you know. But uh, technically flow, of course, is the part of us that essentially is connected with the body because all the, let's say, reproductive and active aspects that have to do with the body are in the lower part of the body. Uh, both for enjoyment, but also for survival. So when we are constantly up here, we don't need down there. That's perfectly fine. When we need to be either in, you know, in a pleasurable state or in a body state for whatever reason, we need the energy down here. And typically, if we would be living different kind of lives, we would have both of these faculties available freely. And some people still do. But for most of us, because we do so much go, go has become the pattern. Because, of course, everything you do often through repetition builds a pattern. So now you have a body, emotion, mind, habit pattern that keeps you up here all the time. And that's where the energy also pools when it constantly happens, which is why we all have... Um, tight shoulders and neck and jaw and head. And uh, with that, that becomes your primary go-to pattern. And then when you want to have flow, that pattern isn't as developed. It's a little bit, I always liken it with mm -hmm. bodybuilders, right? You see bodybuilders who have like these massive upper bodies and then they have these spindly little legs because they don't actually train their legs and their butt. And it's a joke, right? It's yeah. a trope, but it is a bit like that. We do, we train the go muscle all the time, but we don't train the flow muscle as often. And so our lower body is energetically spindly legged, so to speak. And then, of course, when we want to do the things that we are really enjoying, like, um, you know, creative endeavors or connection or sex or pleasure or, um, you know, engaging with our senses, we, are, we have atrophied flow muscles, so to speak. And so in, in my book and in the work I do outside of the book as well, because I work with the same principles in relationship and with men and within the context also of trauma, um, what, what I look at is how do you strengthen flow if you need more flow? And how do you make the flow practice such that it can in, be incorporated even in the busiest of go days? And that's been kind of my um, personal game with myself is to constantly come up with new practices that actually allow for that reversal in very quick bursts. So it's available when you need it, but it doesn't, you know, it's not more doing. Yes. And so you're built, so this, and this is what you're, where you talk about your wild woman's foundational practice, right, Michaela? Yes. It's, it's integrating practices into your, into your everyday life that will bring you back into flow, bring you back into your body so that you can access. You know, I love the fact that, you know, this is really what you're, what I learned so much about through your book is how much wisdom, all of our, like, our wisdom is in our bodies. It's in our, it's it's in our power center is like our lower um, pelvic region, and correct me if I'm if I'm saying these, this incorrectly, um, but your decision making, right? If you're able to live more in your body, you'll be able to make 
decisions more readily that, that, that align with you. Your intuition, your, your, you, you teach different intuition um, honing practices. And like you said, this, this is practices. These are skills that you can build, which... Yes, it makes it makes perfect sense, right? Um, and this is why it's so important. I think that there's so many of us that are we've lost touch with making the right. We're, we're like, like, how do I make that decision? You're like, you're stuck. And 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 one way to get back into it, which is like these simple tools that you're teaching, is to get back into your body. I was just, anyways, it's profound. It, it, it's not complicated, <laughs> but it's very important. It really is. Like I was, I want to tell you this week, I was because I work at my desk so much, and I was like, okay, I'm going to apply what Michaela's teaching here. I'm going to like just lay on my couch for a bit. My body is telling me I'm really tired, and I need to rest. Like this is not going. <laughs> but I was like, and you're thinking, and I'm thinking, okay, Robin, you got to take a break. But that's not. That's a good thing. It's a very, very good thing that my body's telling me you just need to rest, lay down and breathe deep and how important rest is Michaela. Yeah. Right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, there's a lot of things in what you just said. And, and the, I think the important thing is to understand that it's not about fetishizing the body, so to speak, as like the best of the best of the best tools. It's bringing the body back into the general, um, let's say, consortium of advisors, right? So what I mean by that is uh, yeah. we have different faculties, one of which, of course, is our body and then our emotions and our mind. And, you know, and then there's education and things like that. So uh, one of the things that happens when we are primarily in our head, then that becomes the biggest advisor, so to speak. And very often, um, even our heart is kind of put second to the mind because the mind is just so very, very, very developed. And so what all these practices are about is to essentially avail ourselves of this real wisdom that happens in the body and that then also encompasses more of the emotion uh, as an available tool, but not um, foregoing the mind, obviously, but integrating mm -hmm. those aspects, right? And so w when you're saying you can feel how tired you are and you're actually laying down, that is key for, let's say, long-term success in managing your system. Because if you're constantly overriding the body for the sake of the mind, you'll burn out and people do it all the time, right? Your adrenals are fried, your nervous system is no longer able to um, regulate itself. And that's a very bad state to be in. So we have to fairly heavily lean on body practices in the context of creating a balance. But then once that's done, then uh, you can pick and choose what you need, right? You can sometimes make decisions with your mind that override, let's say, fatigue. But then the moment you're done with that, you can also hear the fatigue and give it space and actually rest. And you can learn the difference between, let's say, habitual chronic tension and situational tension when you need it. And, you know, there's, there's a lot in there where you can work with your body for really optimal performance, so to speak. Yes. I love that. I know everybody has to read your book and listen to it as well. Um, cause it's, cause it's, cause this is just a very quick interview. We're not, there's no way that we're going to be getting, um, covering everything, but I, you know, I, I just love and appreciate the story you shared about your friend James and you, and you're, you're talking about your intuition during this chapter about, um, one of you, you said he's one of your dearest friends that you like, he was out of your, besides your husband, he was one of the people in your life that you just like love spending time with. And you, 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 you woke one night and you actually saw or felt his, his accidental death happen. And I don't want to, I, I, you know, I want people to read the book to hear that story, Michaela, yeah. but it demonstrated to me how powerful our intuition is if we are able to listen and be in tune with it. That was 
an incredible, incredible story. Mm. Mm. Um, and you, mm. you say that our intuition is like, I, I love this. You say like learning about our intuition is like um, we're all born with with it. Right. And some of us have like like learning to play an instrument. Some are extraordinary musicians. Like there's some people that are just completely gifted beyond and they can play everything and just be like concert pianist. But then there, we can all learn to play an instrument with practice, practice, practice. And the more we practice something, we can be better at it. And so in your in your practice, are you helping you, you are helping people with with learning how to um, hone their intuition, their skill of intuition, correct? Yes, I would go. Well, I, I want to say also about intuition. Of course, intuition is such a big part of what's available in the body. Because, of course, when you look at how human beings developed, right, being able to feel outside of yourself was a fundamental survival skill, right? And uh, any yes. mother, of course, knows that you can feel your child from, you know, mile, many, many miles away. And of why is that? Well, because all humans are connected in many different ways. Um, you know, uh, you don't even have to be very spiritual or metaphysical, just mirror neurons in the body, right? I mean, there's so much there that allowed us to actually survive. And anybody who's ever hunted or fished, right, knows that you can, with your body, feel the movement of animals and so on and so on, right? So it's it's not exactly, you know, some highly esoteric thing when we talk about developing no. intuition. And I want to say that because a lot of time people think that's like the domain of psychics or something like that. And it's not. It's something that's a big part of what we are able uh, to do and uh, you know, it's very useful. And so within the context of that, my entire work is essentially geared towards giving people access to the skills that they um, have or, or to the attributes that they have naturally. And so my entire work is about skill development, essentially, because these are all skills, right? They're not... Yes. Um, they're not voodoo or woo-woo kind of things. Um, they're all learnable skills, everything from, you know, intuition to dating to um, how do you use your body for different things in different times. Um, it's skill development. And when you take it out of the kind of magical realm of, oh, how did that happen to this is how this happens and you can practice it and you can actually repeat certain actions and, and practices and become sufficient I think that's uh, very empowering for people when they understand that. Yes. You, you share a story about a client that you're working with who had different job offers available to her. And she, she did use, she, she, she sat with those opportunities. I think it was between two or three opportunities. And she was going into herself and tapped into her intuition and her body and her all of her faculties and decided, okay, this one out of the opportunities, this one feels the best. And it turned out she, she made the right, which I think this is it. Like the more we practice and she made the right decision. And I, you shared that um, within a few weeks or months, I, um, it was that, that that opportunity, the other opportunity it was like the company did a quick layoff of all their new employees. It was just like, oh, well, she's like, thank goodness, I, I did, I did make the right decision, and I followed my intuition on it, and it didn't steer me wrong. And yeah. I think we can all have, we all have similar experiences when we can really tap into our own wisdom and be like, that didn't, that, that opportunity didn't feel right. This one felt better. So <clears throat> can we let's talk about dating and relationships and how <laughs> all that? Of course, we have to come full circle because a lot of our listeners, of course. This is what they, we want to learn, right? How to be better in relationship. And so how do you suggest people who to prepare themselves when they're, while they're dating, even before they start dating, let's say, to make the right, or let's just go with that question and see what, I would love to see what you have to say about that, Michaela. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very important that we make some distinctions around that, right? So um, hmm. one aspect of, getting into relationship or maintaining a relationship is, of course, um, 
like, oh, well, let's see how I can say this. There's psychological aspects and then there is skill development aspects. And both need to be addressed. It's just quite interesting mm-hmm. that mostly when people or address the psychological aspect, they often address it outside of the, let's say, skill development aspect. Meaning people might go to a counselor or therapist while they're not in a relationship or when they're in trouble in a relationship, right? These are usually the two options is that people go to a therapist when um, they can't get the relationship they want or they notice that there's something that's holding them back or they go when there's trouble. You know, very few people um, understand that, you know, it's useful to understand what's happening when you're not in, uh, let's say, a dire straits situation. That's the first thing to say yes. there. It's that yes. um, having an understanding or a roadmap is very important. I'll talk a little bit about how to do that. But then the other aspect is that, of course, um, once you have a roadmap, you can you can only learn by doing meaning it's all in the skill development domain and you can only develop a skill when you actually practice. So, you know, we would, you were talking earlier about learning an instrument. If you've never played the piano and suddenly I want you to play whatever back on the piano, you're going to not be able to do that because you're actually unable to mobilize the motor skills or the, you know, musical skills to play. Even if you're very musical and you know the concerto, you're not having the dexterity to play it in the way it needs to be played. This is true in relationship. It's true in sex. It's true in dating. If you don't have, so to speak, the motor skills or the pathways, you're going to have a very hard time. Can it spontaneously be great? Absolutely. But um, how are you going to make it happen? You will need some skills. So there's the psychological background and then there is the skill development um, aspect that happens on the job, so to speak. <laughs> so yes. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the psychological just as a, uh, as a means of saying that I liken understanding your psychological aspect to having a, a map. And so, for instance, if I'm, I'm about to go up to Esalen, you know, Big Sur, it's like really wild and, and you know, uh, very um, overgrown up there. And, you know, there's a vast stretch of land between the highway and, you know, the, the, the mountains behind it. That's just wild. So I always think about how, what it must have been for the first settlers to make it through these mountains, not knowing where they would end up since they had no idea what was on the other side. So it's very hard to find your way or to navigate properly if you don't have an overview. So often doing a bit of counseling and doing a bit of exploring the psychological domain is kind of getting a big overview roadmap where you can go, I'm here, here's the ocean, I got to go that way. Versus I'm going up this way or down this way, right? So it's that simple and it doesn't have to be this big, heavy, oh, I got to go to therapy. I'm so fucked up. You know, that kind of a thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, you could, you could look at, uh, the appropriate counseling as a means of getting a roadmap it makes it a lot easier. Mm-hmm. And then though, you have to assess which are the skills you need and how do you get them? And long before people start dating or go get into a relationship, one of the most important skills that they can acquire is a connection with the body as a means of having proper understanding and insight into their own feelings and sensations. Because for instance, if you don't know what you're feeling moment by moment, you cannot set proper boundaries, obviously. This is one of the big things that we've all, I think, experienced at some point or another, uh, where essentially something happens and it takes 20, 30 minutes, an hour or even longer till it filters up from the body into, whoa, this was actually not okay. Right? I don't know if you've ever experienced that gap where you're in a meeting or, you know, in some situation and you're like, yeah. 
and you know, you're just going ahead and then suddenly half an hour later when you're out of that situation, you're like, that didn't this was, feel good. Th- th- this didn't yeah. feel good. This wasn't okay. Then it's very hard to get back to setting the boundary because time has passed. So one of the most fundamental thing that people can learn how to do and that I teach everyone who comes in contact with me in some way or another um, is becoming current with what's happening in our inner landscape. Uh, this in neuroscience, this is called interoceptive awareness, meaning the ability to understand physical sensations, emotions, and accompanying thoughts as they arise. This is also what we in our work call embodiment, because mm-hmm. embodiment is nothing else but um, the, um, the being able to listen to the messages of the body. And when that's done, the opposite end of the, or, or the, the other side of the coin of proper boundary setting is, of course, high responsiveness. And high responsiveness in the, in the positive aspect is pleasure, enjoyment, um, you know, the ability to feel really good about uh, the interaction. Um, so, and those are both incredibly valuable and important skills when you start dating and also later in relationship is the ability to set proper boundaries, and then on the other end, um, the ability to be responsive to pleasant stimulus. Mm-hmm. And you, there's a section in the book about um, how a lot of women, in particular, um, will date potential, <laughs> yes. and this is like this trap, right? Because we're we're um, wired to be nurturers and care for people. And it's like, these are things like, you, you, we could really pick out the great things in somebody, but we're overriding things that we and it's like, it's almost like it's this people pleasing too in our society as women. Like we're, um, it's like this codependency, right? We want to be wanted or needed. And so, and we can be the fixer uppers. Can you talk to us about the potential, the trap we can get into in dating? Yes. Yes. yes well, it's, it is so, lit- it's so prevalent. <laughs> it is literally the fixer upper where you essentially take the apartment nobody else wants with, uh, with, uh, <laughs> you know, and essentially with a view of fixing it up and, uh, you know, harvesting the potential of the, of the, of the fixer upper. And that's a very bad idea when it comes to relationship. And so essentially the very cold hard truth here is if you can't live with any trait of your prospective partner as it is right now, you shouldn't be with them. And that's very, very hard for most people because like you said, on one end, we well, on one end, we sometimes don't feel that we deserve any better, right? Uh, there's lots of people who essentially look at that fixer upper apartment and go, well, this we can afford, this we can make happen, this is within our budget, right? And the <laughs> psychological or emotional, uh, uh, you know, equivalent in relationship is that sometimes we look at somebody um, who is not really up to the standards that one would expect. And this is, of course, very subjective. You know, when I say up to the standard, I'll explain that in a second. But we go well with the right kind of clothes and, the, you know, and the right kind of attention and with a little bit of love and with, um, you know, a little bit of time. This is going to be the guy that commits to me. And the, and the answer is no. Yeah, if he's not willing yes. to commit to you now, you should not be with him. Doesn't make him a bad human being, just makes him not your human being. And human that's being. the important thing, right? It's, it's just, it's not about devaluing somebody or, or denying them who they are. It's just assessing if who they are really works for who you are. And so, for instance, I see this a lot, of course, with women in their 30s who now want a life partner to have children with, but are, you know, constantly going with guys who are maybe five or 10 years away from that, if at all. And the guys might even say, yeah, I don't want children right now. And 
all the women here is right now. But of course, when it comes to something like children, <laughs> 10 years from now is not a time you can wait, obviously. And beyond yeah. that, you know, if, if somebody doesn't like, um, the job or the, the family or the situation that somebody they're dating is in, there is a subtle disapproving of who they are, which they will also be able to feel. So anytime you're trying to um, fix up the fixer up or what you're saying is you're not good enough for me as you are right now. And that's a really horrible thing because it's the equivalent. We're talking women to men in what you just said. This goes other ways too, but it's the equivalent of a guy saying, well, if you were 30 pounds lighter and a blonde uh, and knew two languages, you'd be my perfect girlfriend. You'd mm. run really fast unless you have very, very, very difficult internal processes in place, right? You'd run very fast if a guy demanded that kind of stuff from you, um, you know, or even yeah. worse, if he'd, if he'd say, well, not only do you need to lose 40 pounds, but I also need you to be 5'11 and a blonde, right? And it's like, mm, buddy, you're barking up the wrong tree. The same is true when we expect a man to, um, you know, be things that he clearly isn't. It's, it's very hard for the partner in question as well, because they'll constantly feel that subtle disapprovement. And then that creates a whole other kind of unpleasant dynamics in the relationship. I think you hit the nail on the head, Michaela, about when you're dating somebody, it's like you, you need to be really, um, you, like you said, you have to be accepting of, and if you're not, then you like, pay attention, right? Because we're not, we, we, we're not here to change people. I think that's, that's what, that's yeah. really what it comes down to, right? Yeah. We can all change. Um, but it's not like the fundamentals of who you are is who you are. Right. That's the thing. Absolutely. And people do change in relationship and certainly being loved and being cherished does change somebody for the better. But if, if you're waiting for somebody to become something else, you're not loving and cherishing them as who they are. And so it's not that you cannot um, want to develop or somebody who is willing to develop.